This is Richard Close of the Chrysalis Campaign. It is an honor to have you all here, dignitaries and uh, delegates, and with great gratitude for the NGO of uh, Education and Joseph DeMeyer sponsoring me to do this event. Uh, when I do events, I always like to walk away with something I can use when I get back home. And as I reflect on the sustainable development goals, I really took a focus at the word sustainable. In learning, we really need to put the word self in front of it. So the question is, can we really do, since we have massive problems, massive self-sustainable collaborative learning? And is there evidence that this has taken place globally before? Um, and lastly, what we can do about it. So how do we do it? Uh, these photographs, by the way, are taken uh, with my work in the Kenya Rift Valley. Uh, this is a leadership program. So how can we actually do massive programs? What evidence do we have that they exist? Uh, what was the key to making those changes and keeping them going? And what can we do to replicate these massive events? And really, is explosive growth possible and sustainable? Absolutely. This was taken way back in 2003 in a um, mission that is near Zambia with 10,000 acres, about 50 farms, the Thunder uh, Ranch, and has done magnificently well, and it is self-sustainable. Inside that mission is a clinic. This is the expression of a woman that was uh, brought in for training. The key strategy for self-sustainable is for the learning process to take inside the development process, not outside it. So there's zero waste in learning. It's, connection, it's uh, contextually relevant. So let's find some cases where this worked on a global level. First case is a very poor country that was in the midst of wars, adding on other states, um, and that's called the USA. In 1851, which is just before the Civil War, um, the Brits ruled the seas. There were huge shipping competitors, uh, like all colonial type situations, uh, which Africa still uh, struggles with. Supply and demand channels are um, monopolized and just a poor global perception on quality. However, in that independence created the freedom to create. And a couple of gentlemen who were apprenticed through the shipyards came out with a new piece of engineering of a boat. And that boat looked like this, and appropriately called the America. It broke the transatlantic speed record. It sat in the British Harbor and humiliated them for a race for about a month. When they finally did agree to race, and uh, besides um, some takeoff problems and broken jibs, um, the boat finished first by 16 minutes ahead of their competitor. This event uh, went around the world and the world began to see America as a place where um, freedom allowed you to create, vent, make your dream uh, in a very dramatic way. And anyone that could look at this set of sails as compared to these set of sails could give you an idea of that leap. Of course, America repeated this event uh, with that astonished the globe with the walking on the moon. So a key thing here is um, self-sustaining also deals with a sense of values, the freedom and safety to create and do something new. Our next case is also a colonial case. These leaps of self-sustainability have to happen and um, they have to happen despite an environment of uh, oppression. Uh, Pablo Freire's works of the pedagogy of the press is as a true in corporate America and corporations around the world as it is in education. Let's take a look at this example in 1974. IBM had the, the SNA architecture. This gave the mainframe and, and headquarters of the company total control of everything. All top-down control, store and forward was all done that. They also controlled processes within the organization as how the systems dictated. And the desktop was also in their control. Desktop hardware, software, printing. And the company even blocked communication for security issues often with the outside world. But unfortunately, uh, the internet started to happen, and the Intel PC uh, came out in 19. 
82. And when that happened, uh, a fellow called Ray Norda started a company called Novell. And what he came up with is an idea of what he called co-opetition. He aggregated 40,000 integrators from around the world with the freedom and the technology to do office communications and internet communications in any configuration possible. Microsoft was a late bloomer, came in six years later into the market. But in that period of time, very short period of time, this uh, colonial-based architecture that IBM and Monopoly IBM had uh, completely fell apart. PC hardware uh, went to those manufacturers, Japan and elsewhere. Office tools went to Microsoft. Office communications went to Cisco, database and spreadsheets to Lotus. Uh, of course, printers went to HP, and global communication market exploded, exploded on the Internet. Uh, matter of fact, um, many of the people in offices were communicating between one another and with AOL before the corporation's emails came up, and corporations had to struggle quickly to integrate these things. But what's most important about this process is that the power of distribution and supply and demand and accounting systems came all the way down to a micro level, all the way down into someone's living room. With the advent of software like Quicken, anyone could be a business. And this is happening within Africa. Something to take an advantage of. The next thing that was very interesting about explosive growth like that is you need explosive growth, you need a creativity and flexibility. So what happened during this period, and I was a part of this working on the Microsoft certification program, building the first technology center in New York City, Netland, um, there was an explosion of learning. Learning is uh, parallel and uh, learning happens concurrently with explosive growth along with collaboration. So as Ray Noda put all these integrators together, private training companies popped up, 253 of them. Distance learning, regional conferences. I launched the Novell Users Group in New York City with 12,000 people. We had large conferences in the Hilton. Uh, we had CBT training. There was standardization and testing, online support, and a whole technical press. But what's interesting about this formula, this did not come out of government. It did not come out of K through 12, and it did not come out of academia. Matter of fact, in the early stages, there was talk about whether this training should come out of academia, and that discussion really lasted in the room about two minutes. By the way, now there's about oh, 10 million, I guess, certified professionals around the world, and about 100 certifications, all that are bypassed to traditional education. Now, going back to 1928, uh, Edward Lindemann wrote a book called The Meaning of Adult Education, and his complaint, along with Dewey and others, was that um, subject-based training, where we learn all these things the way we do in uh, our K-12 through system, was incredibly inefficient um, and unrealistic that we would spend 18 years of doing all of this, and then uh, one day when we get a job, it all applies. The most efficient way to train really is, like I said before, is from the development uh, cycle or industry from the inside of it on out. So situational apprentice training uh, produced the America uh, boat, but it also produces many other things. But the situation, if I learn based on the situation I'm in, everything is 100% relevant. Um, it is also, in order to do training the way we want on the right subject base, to produce textbooks around the world, we must sanitize religion, culture, and worse yet, we sanitize out human values, what is right and wrong. And that creates a whole lot of problems. Um, but in situational apprentice training, I'm learning with those cultural values um, instilled in the very process of the mathematical equations I'm learning. They're very, very different ways of doing learning. Now, in 1998, I coined the phrase in search learning, which basically was a challenge. When learning management systems were first coming out, they replicated the top-down colonial base of the classroom. It was indexed, assessment, teach, test, 
Um, it was sequential page turning and it was also a huge block of information and my complaint was is that we learn naturally by little snippets of information. That's the way uh, the internet works today. So how do we really learn if we put technology aside and learning uh, theory aside for a moment? I start with a problem. I discover, I look for uh, different solutions for that problem. I'll pick one that I'll adopt for myself and then I'll implement it and share it with other people. We'll see the results of it, whether it worked, whether it didn't work. And then I will share my final results with the world. And when we do it that way, that collaborative process on the internet has an interesting thing. And that when we collaborate and we feed that information back onto the internet, um, it changes the discovery process. It changes uh, Google worldwide knowledge base. We also do personal change. I've adapted it. And that personal change, once put out on the net internet, is global. So the days of just sitting at a desk, staring at an index textbook, has a significance, but the bypass of how we learn through the internet is far greater than that. The easy question on this is, when was the last time you went back to a textbook or a professor to know anything that you have to know? All came through your smartphone. And this, I went, moved from search learning into coining the phrase, the global learning framework. Now... What's happening also is that um, concepts like the flat classroom have popped up, and that's basically to say that um, the second I open up my smartphone, my tablet, or whatever, the child is um, plugged into all of these learning, micro learning paths throughout the entire world. So we're collaboratively all sharing with one another. Now, this leaves us with a uh, a situation in terms of our development programs. Do we continue doing uh, classroom-based training index or do we fully embrace the um, relational on-demand development uh, cycle of training that uh, Google and YouTube provide? Uh, my suggestion is to take a look at it from uh, two levels. There's the physical part of the solution. Now what's very interesting about this is that um, what colonial top-down trickle classical training uh, does is it has within it this hidden theme where it does not trust the people it's training, that it treats them like empty buckets, and that's just simply not the case. Um, we need to set up physical programs that involve collaboration, mutual ownership, co-opetition, growing industries as a whole rather than one or two. Um, and the distribution of sharing intelligences through conferences, workshops, but all of this needs to be at a localized level. That's the self part of uh, evolving in massive growth. The second thing is cyberversion. This is the YouTube section of the UNESCO grant on I Am Africa, This Is My Story, and you see a variety of things that's interesting. Um, one thing that you see with the photograph of a tree, that is actually a um, Northern Sudan student doing a old tale in a contemporary format with contemporary music um, and using a Japanese anime format. So this moshing of knowledge of giving people a voice that normally would have not have a voice all is out there we can easily use these systems to globally share how we farm uh, fish farm micro business um, uh, a number of different things journalism but we need a cyber version that's community, that's collaborative. One of the sad things I see often with NGOs when you look at their Facebook pages is that they're just a series of PR clips, one after another. There's no real discussion going on in it. And that's not um, social networking. Social networking is when people start collaborating with one another and it motivates and it moves on its own accord. Now, there are cases where the internet can take localized things and scale them up at a really wonderful rate. Uh, Jewish-Palestine Living Room Dialogue Group, which is Libby and Lem Telvin, or some friends of mine, for over 28 years, they have been doing conferences between Israel and Palestine, of all things. And these little small living room conferences are just breathtaking to watch. Around four years ago, 
they were asked on a challenge to take on Abuja, which is Muslims, Christians, and local tribes. It is a remarkable uh, conference, but what they did is they published how to do this content on the internet along with the video so people could see how it was done. This is uh, starting to go viral right now. In Cote Tour, we've, we've seen more of these conferences, but what you're seeing right here is someone using the same material for albino and Africans as for reconciliation, and this is in the heart of the Congo. So we now know with internet we can clone uh, programs. Now, Len and Libby don't have to participate in all of these. All they do is they Skype from San Mateo to help coach the people do it. Another great case of it is the Lost Boys of Sudan. I met Jacob Atem actually in the UN right here uh, at a literacy meeting, oh, about four years ago. And uh, we were looking at doing a research project. But the interesting thing is the Lost Boys of Sudan, the 3,000 of them that are scattered across the US and UK and Europe, have done for the most part extremely well. And that's because of value systems they had. Um, that declared that education is my mother, my father, I'm my brother's keeper, a series of values that they had that helped their survivability. But all of those features are collaborative features. When Jacob was in schools, he would seek out um, those faculty who would work with them on a personal level and coach him. So all of these things are scalable, but the success on these programs is not because of a curriculum I'm saying that from an instructional designer point of view but it's from the human side of this one of the things we learned in New York City of young men of color from Joni Schwartz's work in the downtown learning center is that when young men of color went through stem programs and went off into other universities it was not the stem curriculum that helped to do that what what helped them succeed was that they were with teachers who were bleeding edge, who cared, and who mentored them. Basically, young men of color had fathers that could mentor them and stick with them all the way through the collegiate process. So the key thing here is where before we might look at trickle-down classroom and its curriculum and it's just getting them to be literate. That's really not the case. The case is a value system. It's the context. It deals with the safety of learning and the promise of opportunity. And these are things that are self-sustainable within the internet. Now, to put this all together, we're looking at uh, a Somali, Somaliland inter-country learning system. This system would be Facebook-like, um, where people have their own pages, and we could set up groups by industries, I'd have a cyber library, a literacy program, but we could actually connect um, two countries together along with North and South Sudan, along with Kenya and Ethiopia at the same time, and connect that right into the refugee camps. Probably and hopefully empty out some of the refugee camps to go back as we can scale up those communities. But all of this is providing the training and learning resources inside of the development process. So it's 100% relevant, 100% financially efficient, and scalable on a very local level. So again, my name is Richard Close. I'm really grateful for all of you and being with this distinguished panel. Quite an honor all the things I've learned today from them. Um, if you would like to contact me, see my background here is my contact information. And we your prayers are with all of you in your programs that you're out there and all those great people that are working in the trenches. And I would like to thank you so much for your time.